space, you know. This meeting is being recorded. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to next chapter, which is Samach. Okay, so um, <clears throat> it says the tour like this. Now we're going to the second blessing of Kriyat Shema. Plige be ptichata. So there's a machloket dispute how it's supposed to start. Rabbi Yudah Amar Shemuel Ahavar Abba. Some say it's supposed to say Ahavar Abba. But Rabbanan Amre Ahavat Olam. And the rabbis say Ahavat Olam, right? Um, so... Here, right, it's a it's a it's a split, right? That uh, the Ashkenazim they say Abaraba, and we say Abat Olam is uh, based on this machloket here. And uh, so it says in Pasak Rab Alfas in the Rift Paskent, Kirabanan, like the rabbis. What about the Geonim? So they decided Lomar Shachrit Abaraba. In the morning, to say Ahavah Rabbah, the Arvit, in the evening, Ahavah Tolam. Let's set the dish names. This way you do both of them. The Chen Nohagin, so says the tour, that's our custom, the Ashkenaz in Germany, right? The uh, Ashkenazim, that's the way they do. The Ena Potachat Baruch doesn't open with Baruch. The Fisha Hiss Mukhale Chavertah. Why is that? Because it's next to its uh, other blessing, right? This. Juxtaposed. You'll say or the choten baruch atashem. So what's the end? How does it finish? Abocher be'amo Israel be'ahava like that. Good. Okay. So let's see the bit yourself on that. So it says with Yosef <clears throat> that this, where is this brought down? What's the source for that? The Soper Kama de Brachot, first, the end of the first chapter in Brachot, Yudalef Amudalef, Um Mashkatav, that which they wrote, Gaonim Echriu, that the Gaonim passed in a certain way, Ken Katvo Tosot, that's what it says in Tosot, we are Rosh, and Rosh, Aval, Bar, it says the Rambam, Katab Bishnehem, Ahabat Olam. He writes that you do Avat Olam for both of them, right? Whether it's morning or night. Kudibri Arif, like the Arif. Vechen minhag b'nei sefarad. So that's the custom of the Sephardim, right? Uh, of the Spanish, whatever, right? From Spain, Sephardim. So, uh, yeah, so that's the way it is today until this day. <laughs> Nothing has really changed. Okay, so let's see the Shulchan uh, on that. Ahavat olam, ahavar abba. (coughs) 
So, says Shulchan Aruch, Bracha Shniya, the second blessing, Havat Olam, right? As we said. That's what the Sephardim do. So says the Ramah over here, Haga, Yeshomim, Ahavar Abba, Vechen Noagim Bechol Ashkenaz. So the Ashkenazim do Ahavar Abba, Vena Potachat Bebaruch, it doesn't open with Baruch, this blessing. Why is that? Mipnei Shehu Smucha Lechaverta, the Berkat Ratzir Or. It's close to its uh, right other blessing, juxtaposed. Vehim hi potet Berachat Torah, so there's also another question. Does this blessing uh, absolve you from the blessings of the Torah? In other words, if you forgot to say them in the morning when you woke up, does this absolve you or not? Right. So over there it talks about that. So we did talk about it, right? We covered it. And what we said was that it's a machloket, you know, if it covers it or not. So the issue was like this, you know, that if you already said this blessing, since we're not sure if it covers it or not, you can't go back now and do the blessings of the Torah. Because you may have already fulfilled your obligation with this blessing. So what would, be, what would be your solution if this happens to you? Hopefully it won't happen to you, but if it does, right, what will be your solution? Go to your friend, you know, somebody that you know, he hasn't prayed yet, Shachrit, and hear the blessing from him, you know, the blessings of the Torah. So he'll have you in mind, you know, and this way he'll cover you. Uh, but you have to tell him about that, right? Otherwise, it's not going to work. You have to tell him to have you in mind. Otherwise, he's not going to have you in mind. He's going to have only himself in mind. Okay, good. So, yeah, hope you have some good neighbors where, where, wherever you live. You can do these kinds of things. Or a uh, good shul you can go to, you know, and uh, right, to solve your problems over there. Okay, good. By the way, just um, just since I mentioned the, the issue of going to shul, there's a halacha like this. You should know, by the way, because some you know sometimes the ladies are asking me about this. You know, some people are also asking me um, that uh, that you know they're like they think that when you go to a new shul, you know, whatever you move to a new neighborhood, and you want to go to the shul there and attend the shul, like you need permission from the rabbi or something to go there. You know, no such a thing like that. By the way, you should know you don't need permission from anybody to go to the shul and be there, you know? If you're Jewish, whatever, even if you're not Jewish, the truth is, you know, nobody can really stop you from going <laughs> going there. But, you know, especially if you're Jewish, right? because you know what, you know why that is? You know why? Because the, the synagogue, which is in the community, belongs to the whole community, you know? So it, it belongs to everybody, you know? Everybody who lives there, whatever, or prays there, whatever it may be, right? It's a, it's a public place. It's not a private place, a synagogue. So he, therefore, you don't need permission from anybody to go there. You know, you don't need anybody's stamp of approval. You know, give me that stamp, Rabbi. You know, yeah, stamp me in. You know, what do you need a stamp for? What, uh, what do you need a stamp for? What, just go there and you pray, like everybody else. <laughs> you know, so no such a thing like that. When a person does this, you know, I mean, I always tell people, you're asking for trouble. You know, like don't don't ask for permission. You don't need permission. What, what, uh, you know, like what, like somebody has to judge you. You know, they have to be judged. You know, to get into the synagogue. No such a thing like that. There are, by the way, there is something else, though. You know, there are some synagogues which are private. They're privately owned, you know, by somebody. That's a, different, a little bit different there, you know. So if that person who owns the synagogue doesn't want you there, you really shouldn't go. But, you know, I mean, uh, but you don't really have to ask him because he lets everybody in, you know. Only if he tells you, I don't want you, you know, so then you, you can't come in because you're trespassing, you know. <laughs> but, but a synagogue which belongs to the community doesn't belong to the rabbi, you know. The rabbi doesn't own that synagogue. It belongs to the community, but everybody has a share in it. That's the way the halakha is, you know. So there's no reason to get into these things, you know, uh, and some kind of imaginary things in your head. You know, I have to ask the rabbi to go there, you know. That's what are you asking for. What, uh, Hashem told you to go there. God told you to go there. So what do you need the permission from the rabbi for? What, uh, what does that have to do with the rabbi? Okay. Amen. Very good.
when I tell you, you know, it's like this, that if you find a, if you find a place like that, the synagogue, you know, where the rabbi tells you not to come there, you know, for no reason, you didn't do anything bad. Anyway, you wouldn't want to be in a synagogue like that, you know, because that's not a good place to be. You know? It's like the rabbi is a mean person, you know. Like, like, why would you want to pray there anyway? What's the point? I mean, kick you out. It's like, nope, you're not welcome. Yeah, you're not welcome. <laughs> what kind of rabbi is that? You know, that's a rabbi. That's like more like a more like a policeman. You know, whatever. I don't know. Whatever. It's some kind of mafia. You know, whatever. You don't want to pray in a place like that anyway. You know, you shouldn't go there. But, uh, you should go to a place where the rabbi puts a good eye on people, you know? He's, he sees with the people with a good eye. Not with an evil eye, you know? Checking people out, you know? Suspicion, you know, this. And, but, uh, that's not a good place. Okay. Anyway, that's the way it is. Um, so let's go on with this. Let's go on to the next one. My rabbi, you know, he had a Marana Rosh Ravadia. He had a good eye, you know. So, <laughs> when he when he opened his synagogue, you know, like uh, this was like the, towards the last years of his life. He opened a synagogue, private like synagogue, in his building there. So what do you call it? Uh, they opened it like right before the High Holy Days. So uh, the gabai of the synagogue, you know, that he appointed to be the gabai. He called me up, you know, and he says, I want to speak to you, you know, whatever. So I, I came to speak with him. And he tells me, he says, you know, he says, the rabbi wants to invite you, you know, to come and pray there for the high holy days, you know. Says, and also he says, he wants you to sit in the rabbi section over there with the rabbis, with the big rabbis there. I was like, who, me? You're talking to me? You sure you're talking, not talking to somebody else? So he invited me to come in, you know, and to pray there, you know what I mean? That's a good, that's a good rabbi with a good eye, you know. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of rabbi you want to be with, somebody who has a good eye for you. Yes. <laughs> He wants you to be there, you know? So if, if, if they don't want to invite your, your students, that means they don't want to invite you. Yeah, what kind of rabbi is that? You know I mean? You know, whatever. Yeah. He doesn't want you there, you know? Yeah. Unless you're a bad boy, you know, if you do some bad things, that's, you know, that's something else. I'm not talking about that, right? You make trouble over there, you know? You make all kinds of trouble. Not talking about that. Okay, whatever. Anyway, let's go back to our discussion. Let's see if that... Back to the Shema. So yeah, uh, so it says here the uh, bet yourself. Katab Rabbein Wagadol Maria Avuhav says Rabbi Maria Avuhav she geonim be Arashba the geonim and the Rashba hiskimu she ben be yachid ben be tzibur whether it's a single person or with a community tzarich likot a brachot you have to read the blessings anyway right in other words there there's no there's no question about that. The blessings have to be read. The Matsati the Rashba, he says, also I found the Rashba, he says, Shkatab Chuva, he wrote in a Chuva. Hakorek Kiyat Shema Belo Bichotia. If you read, he says the Rashba like this, if you read the Kiyat Shema without the blessings, Yatsai the Yatsa, he fulfills obligation. Right? The Brachot and Al Miyakvot, you know why? Because the blessings don't really hold back the Mitzvah of Kiyat Shema. They're more like an accessory, you know what I mean? It's by the way, that's the way it is with all the mitzvot. You know, the the the, the blessing doesn't hold back the mitzvah. If you did the mitzvah without doing the blessing, you still fulfilled, you still fulfilled your obligation for the mitzvah. That's the way it is, you know. So here also the same thing. If you didn't do the blessings, you still fulfilled your obligation. But he says, anyway, if you forgot to say them, the blessings, you know. You should go back and do them. You know what I mean? Uh, in other words, let's say you did the Kiyat Shema without the blessings. We talked about this, right, a couple of days ago. If you did the Kiyat Shema without the blessings for some reason, now you want to do the blessings. So you should read the blessings also, yeah. You know, even if even though you didn't read them with the, today, you know, together, but you should read them afterwards because you, you're still obligated to do it. And as we said, women are not, oblig not obligated to read the blessings. You know, it's, we're talking about the men. <clears throat> Okay, good. So, um, <clears throat> so 
So then he goes on. But it says, even though the truth is that the rabbis, when they enacted these blessings, they they wanted them to be together the, with the Kiyat Shema. Uh, so he says, but nevertheless, these blessings are not like the blessings of like for other things, you know, for instance, like uh, when it comes to tefillin or, you know, for some other blessing like that, for, for certain mitzvot that you're doing. So he's trying to say like this, right, that when it comes to mitzvot in general, when there's a blessing for the mitzvah, like the tefillin, for instance, right? Or for lighting the candles, you know, on uh, on Friday on Erev Shabbat, so there's a blessing for that. So the rule is like this, you know, that once you once you did the mitzvah already, you can't recite the blessing anymore. It's too late because you missed it already because you did the mitzvah. You can't do it afterwards. But says the Rashba here, you could you could even do it afterwards. Why? Because these blessings are not really. Like for Kiyat Shema, they're like an accessory more, you know, like to praise God, to, to say praises of God, you know, all kinds of praises. So therefore, they're not really coming uh, to be like a, a blessing for the sake of the mitzvah itself, to to bless for the mitzvah. That's not what it is. Uh, like for tefillin and for candles and things like this. So therefore, even if you missed it, you can still say it afterwards as well, even though you already finished your Kiyat Shema. That's what he's trying to say. Okay, good. So, because he's not blessing like that, right? He commanded us to read the Shema, like we do with Tfilin. To light the candles of Shabbat. It's not like that. The Fihach says, therefore, so he says, therefore, so even though he fulfilled his obligation already, uh, uh, of the Kiyat Shema, but the blessings he didn't do yet. So therefore he goes back and does the blessings afterwards. So therefore he goes back and reads it by themselves. Right? So it says, we already wrote this in Siman Bevab. But you know, just like you should know that the custom by us is like this, you know that Let's say if a person got up early in the morning, right, and uh, he's afraid that by the time the minyan starts, he'll already miss the time of Kiyat Shema. This happens when you have like a late minyan, you know, lazy minyan, you know, nine o'clock, lazy daisy minyan, you know, the lazy people go to. So it, it, what happens is that that minyan is not going to catch Kiyat Shema on time. Right? Uh, so therefore, what you want to do is when you wake up, you want to say Kiyat Shema at home, you know, and, and then go to shul and... Uh, Pray over there, you know, because the Kiyat Shema is going to be too late. So what you do is, the custom is like this, you know, that even though we already read Kiyat Shema at home, we read the blessings of the Kiyat Shema in the shul and say the Kiyat Shema again, not because you're, you're fully on obligation, just because it's just like you're reading Divrei Torah. So the custom is to say the Kiyat Shema again, <clears throat> even though you already fulfilled your obligation. That's the way it's done today, you know, as a matter of a you know, custom, whatever. Same thing at night, by the way. Let's say, for instance, right? Let's say a person um, he um, he's going to pray late. You know, he's going to a late minyan, ten o'clock. You know, whatever, right? And but he wants to say kiyat shema earlier when it gets dark. He wants to say already. He should, by the way, it's proper to do that, as we already mentioned, right? You should say try to say kiyat shema as early as possible when the time comes. Don't wait. You know, say it early as possible. So, uh, therefore, let's say he wanted to see the Kiyat Shema earlier, and then he went to the Minyan to pray Arvit later, so he's going to read it again, Kiyat Shema, with the blessings, because, you know, uh, that's the way it's done. I mean, you know, so even though he already fulfills obligation, but he'll read it again, it's like, it's, it's Divrei Torah. That's, that's the way it's done nowadays. Which is good, you know, but it's a nice system, you know, whatever, good system, man. Nothing wrong with that. That's, that's very good. Okay, so let's see the Shulchan uh, Aruch here. 
So says Shulchan Ruch, Karat Kiyat Shema Belo Bracha. If you read Kiyat Shema without the blessings, Yatzai Dechova. He fulfills the obligation. Kiyat Shema. The Choser Bekorea Brachot Belo Kiyat Shema. So then what he's going to do is read the blessings without Kiyat Shema, right? Or if he wants, he can, as we said, right? If he wants, he can read it again, the Kiyat Shema, no problem. There's no prohibition to read it again. But here he's talking about what? That he said the Kiyat Shema without the blessings, and then right away afterwards he's going to say the blessings. So he just, there's no reason to read it twice, twice in a row, you know? What's the point? So in a, in a case like that, where you're doing it right after, what's the point of reading it again? You just read it right now. So therefore what you do is, you just say the blessings without the, without the Kiyat Shema. Then... Right, so the Maran also says it's Shukhan Ruch, right? It's good, he says, to read the Kiyat Shema again when you say the blessings, right? Not that you're obligated to do that, but it's a good idea to do that. As we said, that's our custom today, right? That's what we do. When we, when we read the blessings later on, whatever, for some reason or other, we say the Kiyat Shema again, even though we already fulfilled our obligation before. That's what he says in the Shulchan Aruch. Good, good, uh, good advice. Okay, very good. So we're going to go to Gimel. Which was before. Yeah, here it is. <clears throat> so there's a tour here. We'll read the tour first. So says the tour. So he says, these blessings, right, the best way, you should say them, but if he read it without the blessings, as we said, right, that's right. He fulfills obligation, as we mentioned. The Tanan, as we mentioned, in, uh, as we said in Mishnah, Hayak Kore Torah, if he was reading the Torah, Vegiaz Managmika, and it came time to read the Kriyat Shema, Im Kiven Libo, if he had concentration on that, he had intention, Yatsai De Kriya, he fulfills obligation of reading the Kriyat Shema. Afa Pisha Lo Birech Lefanea Ulachalea. Even though he didn't bless before and after. Vechen Piresh Rabbeinu Hananel. That's what it says this Rabbi as well. So this is what it says in Yerushami, Zot Omeret, right? It says there that that means Brachot Enan Meakvot. It means that uh, the blessings don't preclude the mitzvah, right? They don't prevent the mitzvah, as we mentioned. So it's, it's important to understand that. Always, right, the rule, general rule is if you did the mitzvah without blessing, you fulfilled your obligation, as we said. But Rav Hai, Piresh, Rav Hai explains, So Rav Hai says a little differently. He said, if you didn't say the blessings at all, then it will prevent the mitzvah. But it says regarding this, it says in Yerushalmi, So only this, right, regarding if he changed the order of the blessings, he says. Lomar, uh, he, he said the first one last and last one first, right? That doesn't prevent you. So this rabbi has a different opinion, right? According to him, it will prevent you from, from fulfilling your obligation if you didn't say them at all. We don't pass him like that, right? We, we pass him that you, as we just said in this, we saw in the Shulchan Ruch, that you do fulfill your obligation without, without the blessings. But you should read the blessings also, afterwards. Okay, good. So then he says, um, we had it none, and that which we, that which we learned, he says in the Mishnah, im kiven li boyatza, that if he had concentration, Right? He fulfills obligation. It doesn't mean that he, he, he intended to read it. That he should do the mitzvah. That's not what it means. Uh, 
שערי מצוות אין צריכים כוונה. So it's because the mitzvot don't really need that intention. אלא, rather he says, פירוש, what it means is that מתחילה היה קורא להגיע, it means that in the beginning he was reading it just to correct it, that he wanted to correct the, the mistakes, whatever. וקורא חסרות ויתרות ככתיבתן. So he's reading the full and the lacking words, right, like the way they're written, כאדם שקורא על פי המסורה, like a person who's reading According to tradition, and he's very particular. So he's telling, telling you like this, if he had intention to read it, uh, when he read it, yatsa, he pulls obligation. But it says, uh, But he says that, that the mitzvot do require kavana, they do require intention. That's the way the Rosh says, the Rosh says, says also as well. So that's the end of the tour, right? So the tour, Paskin's over here, that mitzvot do require kavana. Right? What does that mean? That when you're doing a mitzvah, you need to have intention that you're doing the mitzvah. There's a machloket about this, but this is the halacha. Okay, very good. That's the end of the tour. Let's go to Bet Yosef. So it says Bet Yosef brings the sources over here. It's the, uh, the beginning of the second peck of Brachot, Yud Gimel Amud Aleph. Tanan, it says in the Mishnah there, Hayak Koreh Bat Torah. If he was reading the Torah, Ve'egiyaz Man Amikra. And uh, then the time came time to read the Kiyat Shema. Im Kiven Libo Yatsa. If he had intention, he fulls obligation. Ve'im Lav, if not, Lo Yatsa, he didn't fulls obligation. Katab Arosh. So it says the Rosh, Alzeh, regarding this, even though he didn't read it with the blessings, Yatsa, he falls obligation anyway. That's the way it says in the Rach, the Rabbi Nami So we say in Yerushami as well. Amar uh, Abba says this Rabbi, Zotomet, Brachot Enam Yakvot Zot Zot, that the blessings don't uh, preclude one the other, right? Or whatever, yeah. But Rav Haigaon says, Katab, then Sidar Me'akeb. He says that it means that the proper order doesn't, doesn't prevent, preclude. But you do have to read both of them, though. And he deduces this from the Talmud, the El, uh, above, the sub in the first, end of the first parak of Brachot, Yud Bet Amud Aleph, Le'olam De'amar Ahavar Abba. So, if he said Ahavar Abba, I didn't say Yotzer Or. And when the time comes, Amar Umay, he said Umay Brachot Enam Yakvot Lekadem. So he says, what does it mean when it says that the blessings don't preclude one the other? It means the proper order doesn't preclude. But when it comes to saying them, you have to say them. Amar Stama the Talmuda Asfirale the Sidan Enam Yakev. So you see from there. But the Talmud says that the proper order doesn't preclude. But if he didn't say them at all, according to this reason, according to this opinion, it does prevent, uh, right? It does preclude. And that which he made this deduction in Rishami, the brachot that the blessings don't preclude one the other. It's talking about when you're as an individual. But when it comes to community, though. They do prevent, they do preclude. Like we said above, it says there, it's all story there with the Gemara. It's also the Rashba, he says, he writes in the uh, end of the first prayer in Brachot, um, regarding that which we said, my Brachot and what does that mean that the blessings don't preclude? So it's one the other. Lakdim, when it comes to order, pasak rabenu hai, and paskins rabenu hai, gaon kach like that. The sidan enom yakev that the order doesn't doesn't preclude. However, vaday tzarich hu likrot et shtehen, but he does have to read both of them. The hadith and that which we learn in the Mishnah, hayav karod v'torah that he was reading the Torah. The shamat mina she'en brachot miyakvot. So you see from this uh, Mishnah that the blessings don't uh, prevent the mitzvah at all. 
because over there he didn't read the blessings at all. Because he's reading just to correct it. Okay, la hatam, like it qualifies there. So he says this and uh, that's what uh, the, 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 the douche in Yerushalmi like that. Tiretz Rabenu Hai. So Rabenu Hai explains that the hacha bet sibur. What's talking about in the community? And when it says the the other gemara, the hatam beachid. That's talking about this individual. There are some geonim who said the ben beachid, the ben bet sibur. Whether it's individual or it's, or a community, and miakvot, they don't they don't prevent. Like the regular understanding of the Mishnah, the Ayakore that he was reading, the law Hilkan, Hilka, he didn't differentiate between community and individual. So he says, I, I agree with them, he says. He says, from these words you see, it uh, lecha. Uh, you explains to you shen divrei rabenu mechumanim. So he says the words of the rabenu, the tour, are not correct, really, not really precise. Shestam shestam bekatav, because he wrote the divrei rabenu high regarding rabenu high that elah leinyan ze. So he says rather with this issue, kamar biyushami. Uh, it says in Yerushalmi, Shenam um, Yakvot, they don't prevent. Shem Shina said there that only when you change the order. But Eav Shale Faresh can, but it says you can't really explain like that. Al Yerushalmi, Al Yerushalmi, Shem Edayek Mi Mishnat Hayakore, because he deduces this from this Mishnah. Zotomet comes, it tells you like this. You see from this Mishnah, Brachot En Meyakvot, that the blessings don't don't uh, prevent the, the mitzvah. The Habadai I Ikal Mishma Meahu Matnitim. So it says, if you're going to learn from that Mishnah, Shadu Amar Abrachot, it means that he didn't say the blessings at all. Tika le Mishma. Velo keshamir, and that which we said, that we're not talking about the order. Ela Shadu Amar, Ela Seder, Ela Chiloko Shel Braben Uhai. So he says, therefore, the differentiation of Rav Hai, Tebehu Yerushami, Biachid, that is talking about the individual, but the Tzibur Miakvin, but in the community they do, they do prevent. Ela Shkatab O, the Tzibur Miakvin, it says also he wrote that when it comes to the to the, in the community that they they do prevent amiratan that means that uh, saying them all together about sidran when it comes to the order and it doesn't prevent you like it says in the Talmud didan in our Talmud so per kama the brachot in the end of the first pair of brachot so it says that uh, it implies from their words it's implied. Then a man de amar brachot miaklot, according to one who said that the blessings uh, prevent zot zot one and the other, they preclude one and the other. Klamar sheim lo amar ela bracha echad. It means to tell you that if you only said one blessing, chaberta miakavta. So then the other blessing precludes it, uh, it prevents it. Ve'af alidez zo shebirech lo yatsa. And even there, right? Even the one that you already read. He didn't fulfill his obligation. The Hu Adin Nami says the same thing also applies. Ima Korek Kiyat Shema. If he reads Kiyat Shema, Belo Bichotia, without the blessings. Alidek Kiyat Shema Ketikna. Af Yedek Kiyat Shema Tikna Lo Yatsa. Even Kiyat Shema itself, he didn't fulfill his obligation. Ulmam Deyamar Brachot Enam Meaklot Zod Zom. According to one who says that the blessings don't prevent one, preclude one the other. Im Karak Kiyat Shema Belo Bichotia. If he read Kiyat Shema without the blessings, he did kiyat shema mi hayatza. He did full obligation at least for the kiyat shema. And that's how we paskin, right? We paskin that if a person didn't read the blessings at all, he did fulfill his obligation for kiyat shema. Very good. But as we said, right, that uh, that's not the proper way to do it. Obviously, you know, at least for the men, right? Uh, for the ladies, it's fine. The women, the ladies are not even obligated to do kiyat shema at all, right? Uh, it's because it's, it's a positive time bound mitzvah. So the truth is, you know, women are not obligated to read Kiyachim at all. So why they do it? It's just a custom, you know, it's a minhag. It's a, it's a, uh, so what they do is, the custom is like this, you know. In the morning, they read uh, just the first pasuk and the first paragraph. That's it, that's all they need. But when they go to sleep, uh, right, then what happens is that they, they should read the whole thing. 
three paragraphs according to the Kabbalah, according to the Arizal. Why? For protection, you know? So you shouldn't have those uh, funky dreams at night, you know? All those stuff, right? You know what I mean, Esther? Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? So yeah, they shouldn't have those dreams. <laughs> so that's why we read all three paragraphs according to Kabbalah. But the custom of the Ashkenazim is that they read only the first paragraph, the ladies. You know? I think even the men, maybe, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, so uh, they don't read the whole thing, uh, you know? The truth is that according to Halakha, you don't need it, the whole thing. But Arizal came and said, you know, 500 years ago, according to Kabbalah, he said that nowadays we need the whole thing because the world has become more polluted, you know, more corrupted, you know? So in order to fix up all the corruption, you know, what's going on in the White House, you know, over there, the Congress, we have to, you know, we have to uh, read the whole thing, three paragraphs. <laughs> That's the only way to do it. <laughs> Three times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah, that's that's what's going on. Yeah. Hey, Kabot Haraf, I'm yeah. sorry. What if what if the person cannot fall asleep even though he's following his minghag and then he has to recite a little bit more? What happens? Yeah, I, I see what you mean. I understand you. You know, I'll tell you something. What's the, no, it's a you, question. You can't fall asleep. You know what you should do? What? The best remedy is learn more Torah before you go to sleep. Uh -huh. And eventually you'll fall asleep. You know, when you're learning, you know, like your head will go down into the book, you know, and just you will fall asleep right there. <laughs> it wakes me up, so that's why. Oh, it wakes you up. Okay. Well, if it wakes you up, that's a good sign. You know, but if you're really tired, that means you're not tired yet, you know. Mm. If the Torah is waking you up, that means you're not tired. Uh, you know, so I, you shouldn't go to sleep, you know, until you're really tired. Learn more, you know, learn, learn more until you're, you know, you're, you're like you're about to, you know. I'll tell you a funny story, right? There's a funny story about that. So the the story is like this, right? I heard this from from one of my first rabbis that I had, right? Uh, my friend David knows him. He was, he's a good friend of ours. So he said like this, you know, the Chazonish, you know, one of the great uh, rabbis, you know, of this the last hundred years. Chazonish. So what happened with him was that he had a chavuta, they say, you know, at night. They had a chavuta. So the rule was with them, you know, they weren't learning on Zoom, you know, it was a little bit before the time of Zoom. They were actually getting together physically, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> the good old days, you know. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the rule was like this between them, you know, that uh, they don't stop learning until one of them collapses. You know what I mean? So if one collapses, they stop. Until then, they keep going. <laughs> so you know, there's a, there's a funny thing that they say about that, that um, right? That one time, you know, so his chavruta, the chazonish, they were learning, you know, at night, and you know, the guy got really tired, you know, so he put his head down, you know, onto the book, you know, and just fell asleep. <laughs> so. What happened was the Chazonish, you know, like is knocking on his head. He says, no, no. He says, no, no. He says, I'm sorry. No, no, you can't do that. Told him, right? You can't fall asleep. But he, but he told him, he says, but the rabbi, you said, right, until we, until we, until we fall asleep, you know, until we, uh, until we collapse. So he says, that's not called collapsing. He says, you put your head down with full strength, you know, you didn't collapse. You just like, you went down slowly, you know, so that means you still have strength. So, <laughs> That's how the that's how the great rabbis were, you know. They 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 uh, they respected learning so much that they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't uh, go to sleep until the Torah, you know, they couldn't do anymore. It collapsed. So you learn from there, right? That if you're if Hashem is giving you energy to stay up, you should learn more. Okay, I'll do that then. <laughs> <laughs> That's the who's way to be, you know. Who's to stop me now? No. Right. Exactly. You know, especially if you if you if you're not if you know you don't, if you don't have a job to go to the next day. You know what I mean? I mean, if you if you're working, you got you know you got to sleep because you know uh, you won't be able to work. Right. Yeah. Right. But if you're not going to work, you know, and you know you're you're lucky enough to be sitting and learning all day, so that's a different story. You know what I mean? We're not talking about that, right? Everybody, everybody's got a different lifestyle. Well, not only that, but like I wake up at night, you know, so um, yeah. the 
the mornings are a little bit uh, they're difficult sometimes you know sure sure i understand but anyway right uh a person should learn as much as possible at night you know uh, whatever he can do uh you know uh, if he's if he's working it's a different story see what happens is like this you know when you work every day your your body changes you know your body your biological clock alters itself to adjust itself for the work so you know you'll be tired you know by 12 o'clock you'll be tired already because you know you the job makes you tired but if a person is learning all day so he sh- he has more energy to learn you know because uh he's not doing physical labor you know what i mean so he's got more energy to learn so if that's the case he should learn more you know as the rambam says right from the talmud he brings the rambam he says right that the, the night was made for learning you know so a person should learn at night as much as possible, you know, until he's really uh, cocked out, you know, like totally, totally uh, finished. Ravadia, the rabbi, he used to, he used to learn like at least till three, three a.m. That was like the minimum, you know. Three a.m. was the minimum. Sometimes even four, right? And sometimes he would go all night until the morning. He had a he had a nosy neighbor, by the way, the rabbi, you know, some nosy guy, you know, who used to watch him from the window, you know, to see what he's doing, you know, like what's going on with this rabbi? You know, like what does he do? You know, I guess you want to see if he's watching CNN or something, you know, whatever, you know, let's see, right? I don't think he was watching CNN, right? He didn't have a TV. So what happened is like this, right? That uh, he he told people, he says, I watch the rabbi every night, you know, so I know what he does. So he says. Usually he stays up till like three or four in the morning, you know, learning. But he says two nights a week, he says he stays up all night, you know, until the morning. That's the way the rabbi was, you know, he used to stay up all night. Also on Shabbat, you know, he used to stay up all night, Shabbat, until the morning. So the only time he would sleep on Shabbat would be like in the afternoon. You know, after like early morning afternoon, like after he would pray Shachrit and Musaf, and then eat the Seudah. So that would be like around, let's say, 10 o'clock, 11. So he would sleep like for a few hours, you know, in the afternoon there. This was his sleep on Shabbat. He didn't sleep at night on Shabbat. Because it's too precious, you know, to waste on sleep, you know, Shabbat. You know, it should be learning. I also heard from the, the, the Chabad guys, you know, my Chabad friends, you know. You know what they told me? Go figure, right? That they say that the Rebbe, you know, uh, the one who passed away, right? The, uh, the last one, right? The final one. So they say that when he got married, you know, you know who he married, right? He married the daughter of the older Rebbe, you know, the, Yosef Yitzchak, right? That was his name. He married his daughter, you know? So they say that he came to Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, you know, he told him, he says, I want to marry your daughter, uh, Rabbi. So Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak told him like this. He says, only on one condition. He says, I'll give you my daughter to marry. No problem, he says. But only on one condition, he says, that you don't sleep on Shabbat. He says, you won't sleep sleeping on Shabbat. All night you're going to be learning. He says, if you accept that, you can marry my daughter, he told him. <laughs> Got it? <laughs> this is the way the big rabbis were, you know? So, yeah, I guess, you know, so uh, whatever, right? Each one according to his strength. Okay, very good. So let's go back to reality, right? Let's get back to reality. We're, we went to fantasy land a little bit there. That's our reality. That's true. <laughs> That's our reality. That's a good one. We were actually talking about it, about okay. Shabbat and, and yeah. also the Arasul sleeping only 30 minutes a day during the weekday. Um, oh, I see. Not, okay, okay. We were we were actually talking about it. Yeah, they say that they say that the Arizal, he would sleep in the afternoon. You know, like three hours on Shabbat. Uh-huh. But not during the week. Uh, uh, during the week, I don't know. I don't. I didn't hear about that. But on Shabbat, this was his custom for some reason, right? Because you know, according to Kabbalah, there's a thing like this. You know, that in Shabbat afternoon, it's not the best time to learn. You know, the the, the well springs of Chokhmah are closed at that time during the afternoon. So it's better to learn at night, you know, and then sleep in the afternoon. 
this is what the, this is what the rabbi used to do. Alba Shalom, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> When you get to the big leagues, right? That's what you do. All kinds of things like this. You know what I mean? You sleep on Shabbat, Kavod Chavat? I'm oh, sorry. Do you sleep on Shabbat? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not. You know, I sleep. You know, of course. You know, I'm, I'm not on that level like those those rabbis. But uh, what do you call it? Um, what I wanted to tell you is that uh, it says, you know, it's, Chazal say that all the blessings come from Shabbat. So if you learn good on Shabbat, the Torah. All your week will be good in learning. You know what I mean? All the blessing comes from there. So if you learn good on Shabbat, you know, you don't oversleep and too much eating, too much eat, too much sleeping. You know, you do your also your, your learning as well. So then all your week will, will go well. You'll be blessed with learning. You know, but if you slack off on Shabbat, where's the blessing going to come from? Right? That's where the blessing comes from, from Shabbat. So, uh, <laughs> That's the way it is, you know? So, uh, lately, you know, like, um, because of this issue that I discussed with you guys, I personally, I'll tell you something, you know, like the last few months, what I try to do is, you know, to do the learning before the se'udah of the morning, you know? Uh, because I know from experience that once you wait till after the se'udah, you can fall asleep and slack off because your stomach is full, you know? And you don't really have the, the, the desire to learn so much anymore. You know, you, you, have a, you have a desire to sleep more, you know, whatever. So what I try to do, you know, is that I try to do the learning before the meal. Right? So this way, uh, that's according to Kabbalah. That's the proper way. Uh, because the afternoon is not the best time for the, for the learning, you know. The, uh, okay, whatever. I mean, we're talking about high levels over here, right? Whatever. But that's the, that's the way it is, you know, whatever. So, um, well, Kabul Harab, can you learn the actual, can you read the the, the, the Parasha Shavua, you know, on the night, you know, on Shabbat instead of like waiting until the afternoon, you know, like after midnight? Are you talking about like just learning the Parsha Shavua, like with Rashi or? Actually, reading it is that what what, what yeah, uh, yeah. learning it with the the commentary in Russian, let's say, or onkelos. Right, that you can do. You can do anytime you like. Sure, that's no problem. Okay. But when it comes to you know the mitzvah of reading, you know the chumash two times a pasuk and one time onkelos, uh -huh. that you're not supposed to do at night. You're supposed to do that in the, in the daytime. In the daytime. So like like you said before the seuda, you know. Before Right, so the proper thing to do, yeah, is, yeah, is, that's what it says in the halakha. You should try to finish it before the seuda. Okay. Uh, but according to Kabbalah, you really should finish it on Friday. The, uh -huh. okay. the whole, the whole, the whole parsha. Mm -hmm. Okay. According to Kabbalah, but according to halakha, you can do like Shabbat morning, you know, like before the seuda. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. God bless. Okay, good. So, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Uh, so, it says the Shulchan Aruch, right? the order of the blessings doesn't preclude one the other. So, if you did it in the wrong order, you still fulfilled your obligation. That's what he's trying to say, right? You still fulfilled your obligation. Okay, very good. That's what, that's what we're saying here. Let's go to Dalit and Hay. We don't have much time, but we have like five minutes maybe. Okay, so. It says in the Bet Yosef, regarding what we said, right, that if he if he had intention, concentration, he fulfills obligation. Rabbeinu, Rabbeinu Havi, Mishnah Zo, it says, Rabbeinu brought this, says the Bet Yosef, the tour brought this Mishnah, Le'el, Linyan Brachot, Regarding the blessings, and I'm not for today, don't pre pre prevent one or the other. And now he's coming to explain that which she says, right? If he had concentration, if he, he had intention, he fulfills obligation. What kind of intention, concentration are we talking about, right? That's the question. The big Gemara, because it says the Gemara, Amina, Shema Amina, says the Gemara like this, Brachot, you give me Lamud Aleph. You learn from here that the mitzvot require intention. 
So then, right, says the Gemara there, but Dache, and it pushes it out. Im kiven libo likot v'haka kere bekore leagia. Right? So, so the Gemara asks a question about that. What does that mean? You he had intention to read it. He's reading it. What do you mean? So why is he reading it if he doesn't have intention? So no, he says he was reading it in order to correct it, but he wasn't reading it to do to do the mitzvah. Pirish Rashi Rashi explains Shamat Bina. You learn from this mitzvot zichot kavanah that the mitzvot require intention. Shehem mitkaven l'shem mitzvah that he should be intending to do a certain mitzvah. Betikshe l'rabah. So he says it's going to be a question on rabah. The Amar. במסכת ראש השנה, he says in ראש השנה, כ"ח עמוד א', התוקיע לשיר יצא. Oh, so over there he says something contradictory. Right? When it comes to shofar, right? if he blew the shofar just for um, entertainment, right? Whatever, right? He fulfills the obligation. So what does that mean? He didn't have intention to do the mitzvah. So how is that, right? Over, see, over here we said, you need intention. Over there it seems like you don't need the intention. So how do you... Reconcile this uh, uh, right, apparent uh, right, uh, rec- uh, con- contradiction here. So he says, Kevan de Krot, what does that mean? That he had intention to read, but so we don't require that you should, be, you should have the intention to do the mitzvah. Right? All he has to do is have intention to read the Torah. But he's reading. So it says the answer is the right. The Rashi is explaining these things now. Ha bekore ka right. That which it says uh, the reading ka asik tana v'ate de katane haya kore be Torah bekore leagia. So the answer is right. He's reading it to correct it. That's the, that's what that's what's going on. Et a sefer et a imiyesh bo taot. If there's a mistake there in the sefer Torah. He's reading it to correct the mistakes. He's a sofer, he's a scribe, right? So he's not even intending to read it at all. He just wants to correct it. But Tosot says there, they didn't agree with the Perush of Rashi. So he says, it seems like and when he says that he's reading it to correct it, that means he's not reading them properly, the words, right? and the proper uh, right, pronunciation. He's just reading it like the, the way they're written in order to know the full and lacking letters. Like these words, which have lacking and full, right? So if he had intention, uh, Love Dafka, not exactly, that's not what it means. Elaklomar means to say, that means he had he was he was reading it the proper way, the proper with the proper diction, proper pronunciation. says Rabbi Yona, uh Piresh, he explains the Korelia Gia, he's reading it to correct it. I know Shaya Magia, but that he was correcting it, and then by the way, all on the way. Right. The way it is, when a person corrects it, he's looking like two different books, you know, to, to, to compare one to the other, um, to correct to correct one from the other. And sometimes he mentions the words out loud, right? That's the way it is. This is the way of the, the scribes. This is the way of to say out loud the words. So telling you like this, right? If he was reading this way, meaning what? That he was also saying it out loud as well. In the beginning, and he had intention also. When he gets to Kiyat Shema, he's reading that, correcting it, right? That he wants to read them properly and do the mitzvah. Yatsa, he fools obligation. That's what it says in Tosfot. So he said that the, the tour wrote like the Tosfot. What about the Rambam? He says like this, if a person is reading the Shema, and he didn't have intention, the Pasuk Rishon, the first Pasuk, he didn't have a concentration. He didn't concentrate on the first. In other words, he didn't concentrate on, on, on his, what he's saying. Shehu Shema Yisrael, which is Shema Yisrael, lo yitzay de chovado. He didn't. He didn't fulfill his obligation. Ve'ashar im lo kiven, but the rest of it, we don't need concentration anymore. The rest of the kiyat shema, just the first pasuk. 
Why is that? Because the first pasuk is from the Torah. The rest of it is only from the rabbis, you know? So the first pasuk requires full concentration. The rest of it does not. If he was correcting and he says whatever, right? At the time of the time reading of the Torah, Yatsa, he fools obligation. But he has to, as we said, right? He has to have concentration on the first Pasuk. That's the language of the Rambam. It says, I already explained this, the words of the Rambam. He says, in the Kesef Mishnah, right? The Kesef Mishnah was also written by Maran Bet Yosef. Okay, so uh, let's see what we got here. Okay, we're almost finished. Should we just finish it off? It's up to you yes. guys. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so it says like this, right? Ubahag says the Bahag, the Sof, the Hot Rosh Hashanah, in the end of the Lord of Rosh Hashanah, Pasak, the Mitzvot, the Hot Kamana. Bahag says the Mitzvot do require intention. That's the halacha, by the way. Klomar, she'd kaven at set be'asiat ota mitzvah, that he has to intend to be doing that mitzvah when he's doing it, before he does it. He has to have intention. V'zesh katab od, that's what he wrote later on, also further, that sa'ich she'i kaven at set, that he has to have intention. So then he says also, the Rosh also agree with that. Chin katab adoni avi arsan, right? Uh, where is this? Also, per gimel in Rosh Hashanah. Uh... So the Rosh Pasuk is also that the halacha is that mitzvot require intention. It says in this siman, this chapter, it's going to be explained with heaven's help that the divrei paskim kerosh, the ones who pass like the Rosh, the paskim, but divrei aholchim aholchim alab, and also the ones that argue with that. It's going to be explained that Siman. Okay, so we're just going to do Shulchan Aruch and we're done. Uh, we finished the whole chapter. Baruch Hashem. Nice. Okay, so it says, it says in Shulchan Aruch, Dalad, right? Yes, uh, Shomrim. Some say, She'en mitzvot tzichot kavana. Mitzvot don't require intention. Yes, Shomrim, tzichot kavana. Some say, right, they do require intention. That's it. Let's set be'asiyat otam mitzvah. Pechina halacha. So says Maran, Halacha is like the second opinion, right? That what? That mitzvot do require intention. By the way, there are some exceptions to this, you know, to this rule. But in general, they do require. You know what one exception is, right? When it comes to going to the mikvah, right? Uh, if a person just like went in, you know, to cool off, he wasn't intending to do the mitzvah of the mikvah, he fulfills obligation. That's one, there was one case where you don't require intention there. So if somebody like pushes you into the mikvah, you know, you fulfill your obligation. He's playing around with you, you know, pushed you in, bah! you fulfilled your obligation. <laughs> okay. All right, good. So, uh, one more shulchan ruch and we're done. So it says here, shulchan ruch, hey, hakoret shema velo kiben libol pasuk rishon. Very important, right, to know this. If you're reading the Kiyat Shema and you didn't have concentration, I'm not talking about intention now, right? Intention is one thing. Concentration, what does that mean? You have to concentrate on what you're reading, the words. If you didn't do that in the Pasuk we show in the first verse, so Shema Yisrael, which is Shema Yisrael, lo dechobato, you didn't fulfill your obligation. You know, so make sure, at least for the first Pasuk, you should know what you're saying, right? God is one, right? Hashem is our God. Shema Yisrael, hero Israel, right? Whatever, right? Make sure you know what you're saying. So then it says, but the rest of it, if you didn't have concentration on the rest of it, if you're just reading the Torah, or just correcting, as we said, right? Doing corrections. He read it. It doesn't need to require anything there. But that's when, at least he has to have intention, right? To do the mitzvah, as we said. The pasuk rishon in the first pasuk. So bottom line is like this, right? When you read the Kiyat Shema, at least make sure you have concentration on the first pasuk, and intention also to do the mitzvah, right? You need two things: one is intention to do the mitzvah, and one is concentration on what you're saying. And everything is good, Baruch Hashem. Okay, very good. Okay, hope you had a nice lag, Baruch. God bless you. See you tomorrow.
be blessed with wealth, health, happiness, and make sure you sleep well after you say Shema, mm-hmm. right? Everything will be good. If you can't sleep, learn more, right? Learn more Torah. That's a sign that you have to learn. Okay, mm-hmm. Laila Tov, Chazak See you tomorrow. Amen, amen.